Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. You know me, my name is Peter Bex, uh, and uh, I want to thank you. On behalf of my team, Morty Dubin, Lisa Simpson, and most importantly, on behalf of the men and women of Johnson & Johnson. For the next hour, probably a little bit more, uh, I am their voice. And what you heard over the last hour and 15 minutes was an attack that went to the core of the people of Johnson & Johnson. Plaintiff's counsel told you that the people of Johnson & Johnson knowingly put asbestos in their product, didn't care about women, didn't care about babies, and that it wasn't just a matter of if, if it was a matter of when that somebody would get ovarian cancer. I told you in Bar Dyer that the plaintiff would come out here with scare tactics. They talk about asbestos. Now I heard talk about fire, the fire department, and cancer, cancer, cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, what you heard and what was told to you about the evidence is not true. As a matter of fact, it is false. When you hear the evidence in this case, you will see that. And what was told to you over the last hour and 15 minutes about fire was like shouting fire in a crowded theater to get people to run and to not get people to think. <coughs> What I'm going to talk about, actually, I'm not going to scream. I'm going to talk about evidence. And I'm going to tell you, when it comes to fire, what you heard over the last hour and a half was somebody blowing smoke. So I'm going to talk to you about the evidence. There's going to be no matches here, no gasoline. Plaintiff's counsel told you, and there's going to be no cause, no cause in this case. The evidence will show that Johnson & Johnson's product did not cause any plaintiff's cancer in this case. I want to start with something that Judge Burleson read to you in his instructions. He said, after the opening statements, and remember what plaintiff said to you, it's not evidence. It was an opening statement. The plaintiff will introduce evidence. The defendants may then introduce evidence. And those reasons are important because the plaintiff has the burden of proof in this case. They must prove to you that not only was there asbestos in a mine that Johnson & Johnson used, but it somehow made its way into a bottle of baby powder. And that bottle of baby powder was a bottle that a plaintiff used, and that whatever was in there, in whatever baby the bottle there was, somehow made it to a point in somebody's body where it caused their disease. That's a lot of steps that plaintiff's counsel didn't talk about. The burden of proof is on the plaintiff to prove that. We don't have to prove anything, but we will. We will. We will bring witnesses here, and we will present a case that will show everything that you just heard was false. Now let me start and talk to you about these plaintiffs. You were shown pictures of them, and absolutely, they are individuals, they are all different. And let me say to each and every one of you who was introduced, on my behalf, on the 
behalf of my team and on behalf of the men and women at Johnson & Johnson. We are very, very sorry about what has happened to you. Cancer is a terrible thing. And I told you during the voir dire process that this has touched almost everybody's life. I told you that it had touched my life. And I know each and every one of you, when we talked during the voir dire, that it probably touched your life. And that's why we talked about it. But what's important in this case, as we talked about and as the judge said, is that we've got to set sympathy aside. And we've got to begin together the journey to discover the scientific truth. And that's the journey that I'm going to speak about. Plaintiff's counsel has said that the only thing that matters is that the plaintiffs use talc and that they got ovarian cancer. There are a bunch of steps that are missing because that's not how cancer works. Millions of women who use baby powder have not gotten cancer. And most who have ovarian cancer did not use baby powder. We're not going to tell you here exactly what caused the cancer in each of these individuals. That's impossible to know through science, and it's not our burden of proof. We are going to tell you one thing that the evidence will show. It wasn't Johnson & Johnson's product that had any role here. We also know two very, very other important things, ladies and gentlemen. Each of these plaintiffs had a doctor who took care of them. There will be no evidence from the plaintiff that any doctor who took care of them outside of the courtroom told them that the use of baby powder had anything to do with their ovarian cancer. And some of these doctors were asked that question. And you will hear evidence about what they said. These were the doctors outside of the court who were responsible for caring for these plaintiffs. The second thing that you will hear in the evidence is that the people who told them <coughs> about talc and ovarian cancer were lawyers' advertisements. Each and every plaintiff will tell you that they heard about talc and ovarian cancer from lawyers' advertisements, not from doctors. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that lawyers may think they're a lot of things. But they're not cancer doctors. We will present evidence from cancer doctors. I've got three of them up here. When it's our turn, and that will be probably three weeks from now, three long weeks, I have to sit over there and I have to watch. And I have to hear things that I know are not true. When it's our turn, we will bring three cancer doctors here. They're called gynecological oncologists. Cancer doctors whose specialty is ovarian cancer. Dr. Cheryl Sines from California. Eric Holcomb in the middle from New York. Warner Hub from Alabama. Together, 70 years of experience dealing with people in real life, not in a courtroom, in real life. And every one of these doctors gets asked the question when they've treated their hundreds of patients with ovarian cancer. Why me? 
how did this happen? And they answer that question for their patients. They've taken a look at all of the medical records of the plaintiffs, and they will tell you, as cancer doctors, not as people who come into a courtroom getting paid millions of dollars to testify, they will tell you that talcum powder played no role in the ovarian cancer of these patients. And they will base this on scientific truth. You will hear in this case about very important studies. And I listened over here for an hour and 15 minutes, and I said to myself, when will plaintiffs tell you about these studies? Not a peep. Not a peep. There have been studies for the last 20 years on this exact question. Does this talcum powder product have any role in ovarian cancer? 181,000 women have been studied. Ladies and gentlemen, that's more women that are in St. Louis. For 20 years, women have been studied to see what the science is about whether or not talc has any role in ovarian cancer. And you will hear about these studies, and the evidence will be that these studies show that there is no role, whatever is in the baby powder. And we will present evidence there's not a specimen. But this product has been studied, and this is what the evidence has shown. I'm going to talk really about three things that Johnson & Johnson acted responsibly in selling its products, that decades of testing confirmed that Johnson & Johnson products do not contain asbestos, and that talcum powder use does not cause ovarian cancer. Those are the three things I'm going to talk about. But let me first tell you a little bit about Johnson & Johnson, because they were attacked. The evidence will show that they acted responsibly. Where did the company start? 1886, three brothers, Edward, Robert, James, came to Brunswick, New Jersey. And you can see in the background the building that they started. In. That's where the company is located today. 1886 they started. One of the first products that they sold was Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. And I have up here, you can see on this old piece of brown paper, the Johnson & Johnson signature. That's the signature of the founders of this company. And you heard motive. It was about money. This is about money. False. Johnson & Johnson's baby powder, the evidence will show, is actually not a real money maker for the company. In a given year in this state, the revenues are about $300,000. But make no bones about that. This is an important product. And it's an important product because the signature of the founders are on every bottle. And they know that this is about trust. This is about the trust of Johnson & Johnson. Because they know that the people who use this product are mothers and babies. And these are Johnson & Johnson's customers. So this is about trust. And Plaintiff's counsel said he wants to hear from people from Johnson & Johnson. You will when we present our case. And we'll bring two witnesses for you to hear, Dr. Susan Nicholson and Dr. John Hopkins. Dr. Nicholson is a medical doctor. 
She is very important when it comes to women's health, and is one of the key people at the company about making sure that baby products are safe. So safe that she uses them herself. Dr. John Hopkins worked at Johnson & Johnson for more than 20 years. He's over in England now. He is a toxicologist. Three kids, eight grandchildren. His family uses Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. Now I want to stop right there and make sure that what I just said is clear. Because there were accusations made about motive, about knowledge, hiding things. These are the people who know the information. And they use the product themselves and with their families. Common sense is something that I'm going to be talking about a lot here. That will be the best evidence that the product is safe. So what will the evidence show that decades of testing confirm that Johnson & Johnson's cow does not contain asbestos? These are some of the institutions laboratories and universities where scientists have looked at Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. Plaintiff's counsel talked about there was rigging going on. There must have been some good rigging if all of these institutions, labs, and universities who did independent testing all concluded that there was no asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. And these weren't just isolated tests. We're talking about 50 years of testing of Johnson & Johnson's products. The FDA, in charge of the safety of consumer products. NIOSH, you'll hear about NIOSH. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, responsible for worker safety. Illinois EPA, the Geological Society of the United States, and all of these laboratories have looked at the same question the plaintiffs are talking about here. Scientists from those universities, MIT, a fellow named Mr. Berger, Princeton University, Gordon Brown, all of these individuals, some of the top scientists, Independent looked at this question, and you will hear evidence from all of them. Harvard School of Public Health, Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, known in asbestos as one of the most important hospitals in studying asbestos. All of these institutions, not hired in a lawsuit, but before anyone even thought, through lawyer advertising of a lawsuit, did their testing, and it was their job to do it right, and they did. So what is tech? You saw the things up there, the marbled meat. May have been kind of cute, but it has nothing to do with what talc is. Talc is not asbestos. Talc is soft and platy. You put it in your hands and you can break it. It's one of the softest minerals there is. You look under a microscope, you see talc on one side, asbestos on the other. You can see the plates of the talc, which is what makes it smooth on your skin. When you see asbestos, you can see the fibers. Hard, long. If those get on your skin, they're prickly. They don't do what the talc does. And Johnson & Johnson doesn't want asbestos in its talc. And that's why it tested. That's why it hired the best scientists. And that's why it was so careful to make sure that there wasn't. There were statements made by the plaintiffs 
that there's no such thing as talc that doesn't have asbestos in it. Back to the meat picture. That's just false. And you don't need to hear me say it. Listen to what the American Cancer Society says. All talcum products used in homes in the United States have been asbestos free since the 1970s on their website today. And Johnson & Johnson's talc has been asbestos free from the beginning. FDA, large deposits of high purity asbestos free talc do exist. That's what the FDA says. Not a lawyer, but the FDA. And I've even got better evidence for you. The first witness who the plaintiff's going to call. Listen carefully for this. Alice Blount, who the plaintiffs spoke about. We asked her this. If the experts for the plaintiffs come in here and say there's no such thing as asbestos-free talc, is that true? Answer, no. For an hour and a half, you saw the meat with the marble on it <coughs> acting like there's no such thing as talc without asbestos. Their own witness is going to disprove what was just said to you. First witness in the case. Please listen carefully for this. It'll be when my colleague, Mr. Dubin, is asking the questions. You'll recognize that. There are two types of talc, which is very important. There's industrial grade talc, which at certain times Johnson & Johnson modeled. Not anywhere near as pure as cosmetic talc. Cosmetic talc, very, very small part of the market and has to meet very high purity standards. But it's very important to keep these differences in mind. Because when you look at a document that says, ooh, I found an asbestos fiber, it won't be from the cosmetic grade talc that's used in baby powder. Be careful, because there's some tricks going on here. And I'm going to talk about them as I proceed. Talc is in everyday products. Talc, you heard me say it in voir dire. It's used going back to Egyptian times. It's in olive oil. It's in soap, sunblock, gum. When you open up a wrapper and you feel that kind of powdery stuff, there's talc on it. Their baby powder products are on the market today. They've been on the market for hundreds of years. And wouldn't common sense say to you that if there's a asbestos at all talc, how come people haven't said that? If it's been used for centuries and centuries, and now suddenly with lawyer advertising, all the talc has asbestos in it and causes ovarian cancer. Some of the actual ovarian cancer drugs that these plaintiffs use have talc in them. How could it be that doctors are prescribing a medication to somebody with ovarian cancer and putting talc in it when we're now told that that causes the ovarian cancer? We didn't check common sense outside of the courtroom when we came here to hear this case. Thousands of products have talc in them. Today, decades ago. So let me give you a little bit of an overview, a little bit of history here that I hope will help you see the evidence. Johnson & Johnson my talc from three sources. Originally Italy, in a mine that was first used in the 1900s. Then in Vermont, and then in China. So as you hear the evidence, it's important to keep time frame in mind. Because we're talking about three different deposits. But what's common to all of these deposits 
is that Johnson & Johnson, before it went anywhere to get tech, was careful. And their deposits that Johnson & Johnson looked at, but didn't mine from, because it wasn't pure enough for them. So what's going to be the evidence? A little bit about mining, because this is going to be important. There are different steps. You select a mine, you then take the talc out, you process it at a mill. You wash and float it. Johnson & Johnson had a 32-step process <coughs> for making talc pure. 32 steps in manufacturing. And then it's bottled. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will be that Johnson & Johnson tested at every step of that process. Every single step. So let's start from step one, selecting a mine. Valchazoni, Italy is where Johnson & Johnson first started getting talent from. And you'll see evidence, this in a 2017 article, the talc that was mined and processed there is free from asbestos. Not my words. This appears in a scientific publication written by a number of people with expertise in the field. And when these articles get published, they have to be reviewed by peers to make sure that they're good science. Their words, not mine. Dr. Fred Pooley, plaintiffs referred to him. He is a world-renowned geologist. He's from Cardiff University. Cardiff is over in Wales. Very famous university here for studying dust diseases. You'll see him cited by the World Health Organization as one of the leading experts on deposits. He's a mining engineer and a miner himself. He grew up as a miner. And he's been to these deposits. Consultant to the World Health Organization, NIOSH, the EPA, and something called the British Medical Research Council. They're the top dogs in England. And he, they look to him. He visited both Italy and Vermont himself. And he pulled hundreds of samples to determine whether or not there was asbestos there. And he looked at samples going back to 1949. And he issued reports. Here's one of them. Looking at the Italian mine samples, he says no chrysotile was found. And you're going to learn about the differences in asbestos. Don't feel right now that you have to know all of it. You'll get some science about this. And I know this is new, um, and it may be hard. But you'll see that there are different kinds of asbestos. One is chrysotile. Dr. Cooley says here that no chrysotile was found at the mine or in the samples. Some tremolite was located, but it was not asbestiform in character and has not been detected in 5-0 talc. 5-0 talc is the Italian talc. Five zeros. You may see that in some of the documents. That's the Italian talc. That's what they called it. He said it has not been detected in the talc imported into Great Britain for the past year, nor in shipments dating back to 1949. 1949, he looked. So you see this word asbestiform. That's asbestos, asbestiform. You will see that word a lot. And it's very important to know in this case that when you, there's an asbestiform version of something and a non-asbestiform version. And I'm showing you a picture here of tremolite. You see the mineral on one side. That is non-asbestiform. And you see the asbestiform version of tremolite on the other side. Most everything in the earth is the mineral non-asbestiform tremolite. 
It's in many places in the Earth's crust. It is very rare to see the asbestiform version of tremolite. And you will hear evidence that if you break up that tremolite mineral, that doesn't give you asbestiform tremolite. That does not give you asbestos. And you'll hear that from the experts. And that's exactly what Dr. Cooley said. I saw in small parts when I took samples, not where they actually do the mining, but in outskirt areas. I did see small amounts of non-asbestiform tremolite. But that's not asbestos. And that's what the evidence will be. You will see that there are different kinds of asbestos, which is important. Because people who know this, when they go inspect mines, you can see it. Look at the different colors, ladies and gentlemen. Amosite brown, mostly from Africa. These are from all different parts of the world. And when mineralogists go to look at a deposit, they can see this. It's most often visible to the naked eye. Talc is over there to the right. You can see the talc is not asbestos. Dr. Sanchez will be a witness who, when it's our turn, we will present. PhD geologist, you can see two photos of him. He's been to these deposits. He visited Italy and he studied the geology. And you'll hear from him when it's our turn. He took samples of the Italian Talcor and the surrounding area and he looked at historical testing data. And what did he find? No asbestos. He's a geologist. And be very, very on your toes when you hear about the expertise on the plaintiff's side. Will they bring into the court for you someone who is a geologist and who's actually gone to these deposits? Vermont. This you will see in evidence from NIOSH and the Harvard School of Public Health in 1979. These are their words, not a lawyer's words, that geologic studies going back to the early 1900s have shown that the Vermont talc deposits contain no asbestos. And the reason this came about is because the Harvard School of Public Health and NIOSH wanted to study the talc workers in Vermont. And they wanted to see if talc without asbestos or without quartz had health effects. And so they specifically picked this area because there was no asbestos. And they say it goes back to the early 1900s. Their words not mine. Dr. Pooley went to Vermont as well, and he took samples. As you can see here, there were amphibole minerals, not asbestos, but a mineral in discrete location, but it wasn't throughout the town, and they were not asbestiform in character. This is what Dr. Pooley wrote back in 1972 before litigation, but to do good science. The McCrone Group, Walter and Lucy McCrone. For, unfortunately, they are both deceased. <clears throat> they are the pioneers in what you will learn about in this case, microscopy. They were the best. And when Johnson & Johnson wanted to hear and make sure that there wasn't asbestos, they went to the best. An interesting thing about Walter McCrone, you see up there Judgment Day for the Shrouded Marine. When there was a debate among historians about whether or not Jesus Christ had been buried in a certain shroud, 
they called a bunch of experts to try to see if it was real. One of the people they called was Walter McCrone, one of the leading microscopists in the world. He wrote the book, and he's the person who Johnson & Johnson looked to. Five years of studying that he did of the talc deposit in Vermont, the source that Johnson & Johnson was using. After a study that had been done, you'll see internal documents from Johnson & Johnson. We can say with greater than 99.9% .9 certainty that the ores and materials produced from the ore at Windsor Mineral are free from asbestos or asbestiform materials. In 1987, you'll see from Macron what I call a 15-year look back reporting to a customer who said, I wonder if there's asbestos in that deposit. These were not done for litigation. These reports were done before anyone started advertising. These reports were done to tell people the scientific truth. So in this document, which is a very important piece of evidence, the folks at Macron write, and say, we have been continuously monitoring composite samples at Windsor using transmission electron microscopy, TEM. You'll hear a lot about that in this case. And they say it's the most sensitive technique for fine asbestos fibers. So when I heard the plaintiffs say something got rigged, I don't know what he was talking about. Because the best scientists in the United States, if not the world, on this topic, not people who get hired to come into court and get paid to give litigation opinions, but people whose job it is and life it is to get the answer right, says here, after 15 years of studying the Vermont deposit, that the Windsor product is free of asbestos. Windsor is Windsor, Vermont. Johnson & Johnson, in about 1965, bought a company called Windsor Mineral. And they owned this deposit in Windsor, Vermont. They did two years of due diligence before they bought it. And now you see a 15-year report here of a company that continuously monitored using the most sensitive techniques and they say it is free of asbestos. They talk about something here called composite samples, which I think is important, because the suggestion was, oh, nobody really tested a lot. When we go inside a mill in my five-step process, and we look at how talc is processed and tested, you'll see that talc kind of comes off of a conveyor belt. And then on that conveyor belt, they create samples for testing. And at the bottom would be the sample. How do they do it? Every single hour off of that conveyor belt, they take an amount of the talc. Every hour, every shift, every working day, they do this. And you look at a calendar, and you see that this was done every day, every shift, every working hour. And you will see that there were over 100,000 different samples taken. And it wasn't just one month. It was every month for years. On top of that, there was quarterly sampling done by Johnson & Johnson itself. It would get quarterly composites, and it would send them off to Macron. So you had every month and every quarter 
And this was for all of these years that this was done. Every month, every quarter, <clears throat> there was no asbestos found. And it wasn't just Macron who did this. I talked to you about NIOSH and Harvard. They also went and did sampling. And you can see here that they say that they did something called microscope analysis, transmission electron microscopy, and x-ray diffraction with step scanning. And there were no asbestos in any of those samples. How did they do this? You're going to learn in this case about testing. Three different ways of testing asbestos. X-ray diffraction. It allows you to see chemistry. It allows you to see the chemical makeup, which is very important. Polarized light microscopy. Use light to look at what I would call context to make sure you don't have a forest and trees problem. The TEM technology allows you to zoom in 20 to 30,000 times to look at something up close. Johnson & Johnson used all of those techniques to test for asbestos. And it actually even went beyond that because it did audits that you will see, where it not only used those three techniques, which you will learn about, but it even went beyond and used something called differential thermal analysis. And you will learn about that in this case. The evidence will show that they're coming here and telling you that what they did was rigged, it was false. That Johnson & Johnson always went above and beyond what anybody ever did when it came to testing for talc. You will see evidence that Johnson & Johnson owned Windsor Minerals in Vermont, and it sold it in 1989. 1989. And down the road, a company called Luzinac and then Emerus became the owner and the supplier. They provided to Johnson & Johnson certifications over a 1,000. that the talc was tested didn't contain asbestos. Stack of documents here of tests that you'll see in this case. That will be the evidence that was done time and time again of this deposit. Guangxi, China was the third deposit. This deposit was also tested. It was tested by the FDA in 2009 and 2010. A one-year study where the FDA went and actually took asbestos bottles, uh, talc bottles, off the shelf in Washington. And they tested Johnson & Johnson baby powder bottles using extremely sensitive methods that you'll hear about and they detected no asbestos in those bottles. Plaintiff's counsel talked about Dr. Longo, who's one of their experts. You'll learn about expert witnesses. He got about 30 bottles or so. Most of them were off of eBay and given to him by lawyers. But he actually went and got off the shelf sealed products that are on the market. And he found no asbestos in the products that he tested off the shelf. So what is plaintiff's case going to be based on? The first thing is going to be based on something that I call a false alarm. Because in 1971, there was front page news about whether or not there was asbestos in town. A scientist at Mount Sinai Hospital 
named Dr. Arthur Langer thought he saw asbestos in town. And an individual who was running for mayor in New York named Kretschmer got some headlines. This was all over the papers that there could be asbestos in town. So what did Johnson and Johnson do? All of their information was that there was no asbestos in any of their talent. And this was of great concern to them. They turned to the best experts available. Cardiff University, I mentioned over in Wales. McCrone, I told you about. Colorado School of Mines, an actual school in Colorado that teaches mineralogy the people who want to get into that. I won't pronounce my Italian is not good, it's really non-existent. So I won't even say the Di Torino University at the bottom, but I do know it's the best in Italy and look very carefully at Val Chisoni. Dartmouth R.R. Reynolds, one of the best geologists in the country they reached out to. MIT, Mr. Berger, Princeton, Gordon Brown. These scientists all looked at whether or not there was asbestos. They all said there was no asbestos in the tower, using the best test methods available. This is back in the 1970s that this issue came up. This is not new, ladies and gentlemen. This was already done and talked about and decided in the 1970s. The FDA got involved after the front page articles hit the media. And they said, we got to look at this. They did a four-year investigation. In their words, intensive. Testing was done. Johnson & Johnson turned over test results to them. Four-year <laughs> intensive investigation. At the end, the FDA and Mount Sinai Hospital, which is where Dr. Langer was from, they all concluded that there was no asbestos in any of the tower. And it was front page news. 100 US newspapers carried a corrected story that looked at all of this and said, we were wrong in 1971. We've looked at this, and there's no asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's tower. 1976, this was out there. Scientific studies have been out there talking about tower and ovarian <clears throat> cancer going back to the 1980s. So when the plaintiff said to you there was a secret, it wasn't a very well-kept secret, ladies and gentlemen, because scientists have been looking at this question going back to the 1970s, and they actually take the product and they test it, and they look at the people who use it and see if they're getting sick, because products like this that have been on the market for over a hundred years, if there was a problem, common sense tells you that you would know. And the scientific studies will show that there is no problem. And it's not just one study. It's a lot. So what are the plaintiffs going to do? Well, this is an advertisement for one of their experts, Dr. Longo. Goes back away. He's been doing this for a long time. A long time such that he'll probably tell you that he's made $30 million coming into court, being hired by plaintiffs to try to convince people that there's asbestos in town. But let's ask him when he's here, did uh, the FDA or NIOSH, when they wanted to know the answer, or Mount Sinai Hospital, did they bring him in? What he does is testify thousands of times in courtrooms, as this ad shows you, 
to get ready for the toughest meeting of his life when he comes into a courtroom. That's the toughest meeting for him. The scientists that I showed you, the Macrones, the geologists, the folks at NIOSH, the folks at FDA, their job was to get this right, not to come into a courtroom get paid $30 million. And you will see the evidence will be that he's got a big business going. It's not just him. He's got a lot of people who work for him to come in and try to convince juries that there's asbestos in power. Talking about rigging testing, let me show you what Johnson & Johnson does. Those are the tests that it does. What will the plaintiff's experts do? They're only going to do one of the test methods. So somehow our client is being criticized for going above and beyond. You will be the judges of who is doing the rigging. What the plaintiffs will do is now suddenly everything asbestos even if it's not. So they'll take a TEM test and look at something, but they won't look at actually what's happening around it. We will look at the whole picture. And we've been looking at the whole picture going back to the early 1970s, if not beyond, doing all of the tests, giving all of the context. And you all will be judge of is it best to go above and beyond and do all tests? Or is it best to do one? Plaintiffs talked a lot about Alice Blount. Well, you're going to hear a lot about a paper she wrote in 1990 to 1991. There's no mention in that paper of whose product is being tested. It doesn't say the brand. She says she tested Johnson & Johnson products, but she doesn't have any data for you to see or for us to see. At her deposition, which you'll hear about, she came with a bottle of baby powder. We wanted to test it to see what was there. She wouldn't allow us to test it. So you'll hear a stipulation, and the judge will tell you that when the parties agree to something, you can take it to the back. So we wanted to know, if you're going to come into a court and say that you see asbestos, you got anything to back it up? Can we please see it? Because we'd like to see if it's truthful. So you'll see here that the parties have agreed that after this deposition, happened, we asked for the data. Can we please have it? And she didn't maintain any documents or data for you to see or for us to see. Johnson & Johnson authorized Macron to give all of its testing to the FDA. And Macron did a lot of testing. You'll see this evidence where Macron said to Johnson & Johnson, going back to the 70s, can we give all of your testing data to the FDA? There was a claim here about secret, not wanting to turn things over. Johnson & Johnson wrote to Macron and said, you're granted permission to turn over our test results on our samples. Johnson & Johnson had nothing to hide. It actually gave permission to share all of its test results. The FDA in 1986 evaluating the test results and all of the information says that there's no need to require a warning label on cosmetic tap. This is from the FDA. This isn't from Johnson & Johnson. In 1986, citizens have the right to go to the FDA and say, we think a warning label should be put on this product. 
And the FDA says there is no need to require a warning label. That's the FDA's job to decide if a warning label should be on the product. In 2014, you will see evidence from the FDA that when used as intended, talc presents no health risk to the consumer. A request had been made for a warning label, and the FDA said that that was denied because there's no health risk. This is the words of the FDA, not Johnson & Johnson. So what will the evidence show on talc and whether it causes or doesn't ovarian cancer? The evidence will be that it does not. And I want to come back to these studies that I mentioned in the beginning because they are such important evidence and the plaintiffs didn't even mention them. Because there was a suggestion that Johnson & Johnson was influencing people. Ladies and gentlemen, these studies of over 180,000 people were sponsored by the National Cancer Institute in Washington, D.C. And the institutions that did these studies were Harvard Medical School <coughs> and Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is the hospital that's connected to the Harvard Medical School. And in all of these studies, 181,860 women were looked at. And these were the women, the evidence will show, who used the products that are issue in this case, 181,000 people. And these published studies say that there's no risk. So what about asbestos in ovarian cancer? You'll see this from IARC, because I want to talk to you about focusing on the right studies. You'll see this from IARC, which is part of something called the World Health Organization. And they say here that a causal association between exposure to asbestos and cancer of the ovary was clearly established. But they talk about heavy occupational exposure to asbestos. Heavy occupational exposure. People who work in factories, in fact, some of these studies go back to World War II, where women were working, putting gas masks together and around chrysidolite asbestos, very important, chrysidolite, the most harmful of any kind of asbestos. And these were people who were around asbestos every single day, and it was chrysidolite asbestos. Johnson & Johnson's baby powder doesn't contain asbestos. And Johnson & Johnson's baby powder is not heavy occupational exposure. That's what this is about. It's not the right studies that the plaintiffs are going to talk to you about. And in fact, people have now come out and they say, IARC maybe have jumped the gun, even on these occupational studies. This is from a, a study that just, uh, 2011, saying that IARC was premature and what they said was not even wholly supported by the evidence. This is very important, ladies and gentlemen. When we were doing voir dire, you remember mention of mesothelioma. There are certain diseases that are typically tied to asbestos. Asbestosis, as the name would suggest. Mesothelioma is almost always only asbestos. And something called pleural plaques, which is a thickening in the lungs kind of a, a calcification, if you will. Not one of these plaintiffs has any of these typical asbestos diseases. Not one. And if you would say to yourself, common sense, if somebody is exposed to a lot of asbestos, maybe you would see some of the hallmarks of diseases that are typically associated with it. Well, we did ask one of the treaters of one of the plaintiffs here on this question of does talc cause ovarian cancer. 
And this is testimony you'll hear by way of a deposition from somebody like Dr. Roosh. He was the treating doctor of a plaintiff, Crystal Kim. And the plaintiffs reached out to him before he was going to go under oath. And they asked him, tell me what you recall in terms of the preliminary questions you were asked. And these were questions from the lawyer before this gentleman, this doctor, was going to testify. She, the plaintiff's lawyer, asked me would I let my wife and daughter use talcum powder, and I said yes. I am going to object to anything outside the motions and limiting. Let's put the record. This is testimony, Your Honor. This is from one of the doctors who took care of one of the plaintiffs. One of the doctors responsible for answering the question of is this safe when people ask. And this is what the doctor for one of the plaintiffs said in this case. So what did cause plaintiff's ovarian cancer? That's what we're all going to be wondering about. This is from the Stanford website where one of the experts the plaintiff's counsel told you about, the one who's going to cure cancer, I hope he does. I bet we all do. But on their website, they say something that is the scientific truth. We don't know for certain what causes ovarian cancer. We do know about risk factors. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, burden of proof. The plaintiff has to show you that what we did caused it. But the very own website of their expert says we don't know for certain. And we don't know for certain. But we do know something about risk factors. And what are those risk factors? The key ones are genetic. You may have heard of something called BRCA. Breast cancer is what that stands for. One in two. It's a gene that some people have that increases your chances of getting ovarian cancer. Some of the plaintiffs have that gene. Personal history and family history of cancer are really important here. There are other risk factors as well, but those genetic ones in the family history are really important. And on those websites to the right of the, some of the leading experts, nobody says that talc is the cause of ovarian cancer or even a risk factor. It's these other things. There are 28 genes you'll learn about genetics here that people now look at that are tied to ovarian cancer. And probably by the time we finish this trial, there will be more discoveries of more genes. We're learning more about genes every single day. And these genes are tied to ovarian cancer. And you can test for these genes with a prick and a little bit of a blood sample. And you will see in this case, ladies and gentlemen, that most of these plaintiffs have not been tested for all of these genes. And I can understand why. I can understand why. But we are in a court, and if those tests were done of everyone, we would have information. We have it as to some, but not as to all. And so this is what you will hear about the family histories of these plaintiffs. Not one of these plaintiffs, unfortunately, has avoided history of cancer. And you will hear evidence about family history of these cancers that are unfortunately within the history of our plaintiffs in this case. And you will see that this history is what the doctors who do this day in and day out will tell you are the real risk factors. You will hear, I talked to you about tissue testing. Somebody named Dr. Rigler, plaintiffs referred to this. 22 plaintiffs, he didn't test 14 of them to look inside the tissue. And he could have done it, but he didn't do it. 
What the evidence will be here as to four of the plaintiffs, there was no asbestos even in the ovaries. One of the plaintiffs had chrysidolite, and remember I mentioned that? And if you listen very carefully to what plaintiff's counsel told you, chrysidolite isn't even in any talc deposit, even under that marble with the meat that he put up under his theory. Someone was found to have chrysidolite, and we'll talk to you about the other three when we present our evidence. But I have a question mark there about what was actually found. Fourteen of the plaintiffs weren't even tested, yet we're in court here being accused of hiding information from you. Asbestos is everywhere, and this is important to remember, that just because somebody sees asbestos somewhere, it is in the atmosphere. And their experts will say to you that everybody, you, me, everyone has asbestos in their tissue because of what is in the atmosphere. I don't think there'll be any dispute about that. And this comes back to burden of proof. Because if that's true, and it is, that asbestos is everywhere, how could somebody possibly say that it has something to do with Johnson & Johnson? When the evidence will be that we don't even have asbestos in our town. It's in homes, it's in roofs, it's in bathrooms, it's in kitchens, it's in living areas in so many different kinds of products. Everybody has been exposed to it. So what to watch for <laughs> from the plaintiffs? Tremolite versus tremolite asbestos. They're going to say and see the word tremolite and say, ah, gotcha. The tremolite is not asbestos. It's a mineral. Attorney questions versus witness answers. Judge Burleson told you that attorney's statements are not evidence. Listen very carefully when their questions asked. Are the questions asked to somebody, tell me what happened, or isn't it a fact that after you found asbestos and then you hid it and didn't tell somebody that you weren't being truthful? Isn't that true? That's attorney testimony. And listen very carefully for that. That's not evidence when you hear that, and you'll see a lot of that. Litigation evidence versus real world evidence. I listened very carefully to what the judge said. And he said in his instructions, when you look at something, consider if they're tied to a party or if there's somebody who's got no skin in the game. And when you listen to the evidence that we present, and you compare it to what the plaintiffs are presenting, you'll see that they're presenting litigation evidence and not real world evidence. And then finally, the connection between test results and body powders. Johnson & Johnson was looking at multiple different uh, talc deposits over time. Some that it didn't go to, including in California. Some over in Europe that it didn't use. And when you see test results, you have to be very, very careful that somebody isn't taking something out of context. Are they talking about the deposits that are used for cosmetic talc? Or are they trying to misdirect and use the scare tactic? Very careful when this comes up. You're going to hear about a product called Shimmer that was bottled in Union, Missouri for a few years. A shower to shower product that had uh, a little bit of glitter on it. It was not successful. As the plaintiffs told you, 17 plaintiffs in this case are not even from Missouri. Five are. The plaintiffs had to fill out fact sheets, ladies and gentlemen, and tell us what products that they used so we could investigate. And so the question was, have you ever used Johnson's baby powder? They had to say, what was it? What did it look like? White plastic bottle. Shower to shower came in three different colors, but not shimmer had a gold top. It wasn't one of these. Here's 
testimony from one of the plaintiffs. I met with an attorney. I thought about it last night. I dreamed after my meeting in my whimsical ways that I saw something that was gold. So then, fact sheets, not one plaintiff came here and said they ever used the Shimmer product, not one. And then, now, fact sheets are getting changed. I used a cream colored bottle with a gold knob after I had meetings. And it wasn't just one person, which could be understandable, because memories are off. But 12 plaintiffs now change all the fact sheets that were submitted in the case. And now 12 plaintiffs are saying that they used a product with a gold top that was made in this state for a few years. You, ladies and gentlemen, will have to evaluate that. One plaintiff came to the deposition. We wanted to see what products did you use. Please bring it with you. One came to the deposition and said, is this the product that you used since you were born? Answer, yes. Would you mind holding it and reading to the front of the label, if you can see through the bag, that is. Johnson's baby powder, pure cornstarch. Cornstarch doesn't even have talc in it, ladies and gentlemen. And this is what the plaintiff brought to her deposition. Memories can be off, no question about that. But this is what the evidence that came out during our depositions. So at the end, the question is, is there asbestos in Johnson & Johnson's products? We believe and have always believed that there isn't. Independent laboratories said there's no asbestos. Universities and research centers said there's no asbestos. Government agencies, no asbestos. Johnson & Johnson's testing, no asbestos. The talc suppliers, Certificates, no asbestos. Who's going to say there's asbestos? The false alarm. The plaintiff's litigation experts are going to come in here and say that. There's been a claim here that somehow what we were told and what we said was different from what we believed. That, ladies and gentlemen, is not true. We go inside and we look at what the people at Johnson & Johnson believe. It's that their powders are safe for use for babies and adults. That's why Dr. Nicholson uses it. That's why Dr. John Hopkins uses it, their families. And that's common sense. So the evidence will show at the end that plaintiffs cannot meet their burden that Johnson & Johnson products did not cause any cancer in this case. So let me say thank you. I always am the one who's getting near the lunch hour. And I hate to do that, but this is so important. So let me say one final comment about thank you. And it goes beyond thanking you for your time here and taking you away from your lives, which we are hugely thankful for. It's thanking you for the commitment that you made when you raised your right hand and swore to listen to the evidence and follow the law. Because during the voir dire process, I told you that this was going to be an emotional case. And I told you that that's something that we were worried about. Because we all feel sympathy for these plaintiffs. Not <clears throat> one of us doesn't. But we have to set it aside. And I want to thank you for your commitment to do that. 
and then one final. We go second. You're not going to hear from us for three weeks. Please. Keep an open mind. Remember, you just heard from me over this last hour and 20 minutes a bunch of stuff that you didn't hear when the plaintiff's counsel got up. So please keep an open mind and wait till you hear, as Judge Burleson asked and said, all of the evidence. I thank each and every one of you. I know this is going to be tough, but it's real important. And on behalf of Johnson & Johnson, we are grateful for what you're doing. Thank you.